Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Brianne Goodspeed. I'm the Associate Editorial Director at Chelsea Green Publishing. I'm based in Vermont in the USA. And I had the pleasure and the privilege of working with Chris Smage on his now published book, A Small Farm Future, with a very long, uh, but we think very <laughs> charming uh, ti uh, subtitle, Making the Case for a Society Built Around Local Economies, Self-Provisioning, Agricultural Diversity, and a Shared Earth. Um, so I'm stepping in for Peter McFadden, who has had a back injury that makes it difficult for him to moderate the discussion. Um, although he is lurking out there, we think, and, and with luck, he may be able to join us for a bit later on. And although I'm stepping in unexpectedly, I'm really excited for the opportunity to do that. I've worked with Chris uh, for quite a while now. And this is just a wonderful opportunity to celebrate the publication of his book and to initiate a conversation around some of the themes and the ideas that he's presenting with it. Uh, Chris has been uh, farming for the past 17 years on a small farm in Somerset. He's a well-known figure in the UK farming community. We're, we're eager for him to also become a well-known figure in the US farming community because his ideas <laughs> really cross over. He's contributed to The Land, Dark Mountain, and Permaculture Magazine, and he keeps a blog, smallfarmfuture.org, and he also blogs at resilience.org. Uh, also joining us is Jyoti Fernandez. Hi, Jyoti. Jyoti's been a farmer also uh, for the past 17 years in Dorset. She's an activist, co-founder of the Land Workers Alliance, and works with La Via Campesina, as well as many other organizations. Uh, so I just want to say thank you before we launch into everybody who's tuning in to join us in celebrating the publication of this incredible book. Uh, what I'm sure will be a lively conversation. The plan is to give Chris and Jyoti about 45 minutes uh, with questions from me and then we'll open it up uh, in the last 15 minutes for questions from the audience. So we would love your participation and engagement and we look forward to your thoughts and questions. So I, I guess just <laughs> before I stop talking for a little bit, uh, just briefly by way of launching in, I'd like to say that as an editor, one of your hopes for the books that you work on is that they land at the right time, that the timing for them is good, and that you hope that a book is really relevant for the moment when it's published, and that it speaks to what people are feeling and what people are needing. Um, so essentially not only being the right book, but, but the right book at the right time. So, well, Chris was working on his book and he worked on it for several years, as many authors do. Uh, I always had the feeling that that would be the case. His argument in the book that organizing society around small scale agrarianism, basically with small farms at the very center of society, uh, that that would represent the most adaptive response to various interlocking global crises and wicked problems that we're all facing in the 21st century, uh, none of these crises were going away anytime soon. Climate change, crumbling democracies, wealth inequality, pollution, degradation of the soil and waterways. What, what I didn't anticipate, and of course nobody did, was that this book would become so incredibly relevant uh, as we all kind of collectively faced and continued to face this unprecedented global crisis associated with COVID-19 and the various interlocking crises that are either associated with it or made clear because of it. Uh, so it's been very poignant to me that the question or one of the main questions that, that Chris's book sets out to answer, which is where do we go from here, uh, is a question I think many people are thinking about in a very acute way right now. Uh, how do we develop a positive vision for the future when things seem so grim. What does that look like? Where do we find the slivers of light and of opportunity in these times? So in other words, how do we orient ourselves? And, and Chris answer, Chris's answer is that, of course, we orient ourselves towards small farms. So I'd like to start there. Um, and Chris, you've now just published a book arguing that small-scale agrarianism represents the most adaptive response to interlocking crises. And here we are in the middle of an unprecedented one. 
uh, and you and Jyoti are both small scale farmers. So uh, I guess my first question to you both, and, and I'm very curious to hear your response to it, is how have you both experienced the past several months and what, what have you noticed about local agriculture in terms of resilience and adaptability that, that maybe you hadn't expected or noticed before? Well, thanks, Brianne. And I've got to say, first of all, thanks for editing the book and turning it into something that hopefully is uh, actually readable, which um, has been a, a, a huge task. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, the COVID crisis, I mean, obviously, it's been absolutely horrendous. Um, but, um, you know, in some ways, I think it's a harbinger of the sorts of things that I talk about in the book and, and the, 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 the kind of shocks um, to um, uh, the, the, the sort of the existing way of life um, that, you know, are only going to become more and more prevalent in the future. So, yeah, just at the point when we got used to, you know, so-called efficient global extended food supply chains, um, you know, densely networked cities um, uh, uh, and all the rest of it, suddenly we're, we're, you know, we're faced with this crisis where all of that suddenly seems to be less desirable and, uh, you know, the as a local farmer, um, you know, suddenly the supermarket shelves were emptying um, and, um, you know, the demand, for, you know, fresh fruit and vegetables in particular, which is the sort of thing that, um, you know, that, that is particularly difficult to, to provide, um, uh, you know, with, with, with extended global supply chains, you know, the shelves emptied quickly um, and uh, suddenly uh, demand for our um, vegetables in our little local veg box scheme increased by a couple of orders of magnitude um, and you know we did our best to, uh, to, to to rise to that challenge and and meet the supply um, but it wasn't easy um, but you know maybe a, a one silver lining from it was that people suddenly reconnected with um, their local spaces the local ecology I, I, we live in an off-grid uh, farmhouse so I, I made a point of coming somewhere where, where there's a good internet connection but I saw it just it just tripped out a bit there but um, uh, uh, yeah, so I don't, I'm not sure which, which bit you missed. <laughs> well, maybe, I mean, th thank you. And maybe this is a moment just to pass it over to Jyoti to kind of describe a little bit what, what I, I mean, you were mentioning, Chris, sort of a um, increased demand in, in the box scheme. And I, I think what we would call in the USCSA shares, um, mm -hmm. I think they're about roughly the same thing. But, uh, you know, so you can either kind of continue on for that from there, if you like, or maybe have Jyoti hop in and, and chime in on what she's noticed. Well, I mean, one thing there was a there was a survey done um, during lockdown by the Food Foundation here in the UK, and they, they noticed that um, box scheme sales increased by 113 percent. And what was really interesting about it is that across the UK, it illustrated how rapidly the um, farms were able to adapt. Um, and we did do a tremendous push to try and get some support to those farmers who were rapidly adapting to try and see if they could have deal with some of, you know, the, the box deliveries that needed to be direct to the people who were isolating or respond to local circumstances. But actually in the survey, it showed that people, even without financial support from the government, um, were really responding to the situations because they were very connected to their local communities and in places where necessarily food banks or food banks or some of the supermarket run you know uh, solutions to the poverty that like increased enormously were held by those local community groups were held by the local box schemes and and people because they knew who needed the help you know mm -hmm. and, and that sense of community was much stronger mm -hmm. um, yeah, I guess the part I wanted to notice is not just about the vegetable sales itself on a, on a small holding, but what, what I noticed, because actually I spent a lot of my time campaigning rather than just the farming part, um, was that my, my daughters were home. I have four daughters that I run um, our farm with, and they grew up with me on my small holding, and now they're teenagers, they're getting, you know, to 17 to age 24. And, you know, life takes over when you get into secondary school, and the way the system works, you know, y there's so many exams, there's this relentless push to get into university and to spend all your time doing homework from the minute you go to school until the time you come back. My youngest daughter milks our cow, you know, and she has to wait sometimes doing it into the dark now after she gets back from school, rather than it being part of a normal working life. And, and when lockdown hit and they didn't have to go to school anymore, I noticed immediately how they adapted because they'd grown up with farming and were just taking over running the farm. I didn't have to teach them anything. They were just growing vegetables, doing all the animals, doing all the stuff and how wonderful it was 
to have our family together on, on a piece of land and, and, and to be able to go walking and visit people in our local community. And people were stopping by to get milk, you know, when they were going out for walks. And it just made this sense that our area was alive and that we knew our neighbors and that we appreciated each other and they really valued that food being down the road. Mm -hmm. Chris, did you, I mean, was that your experience as well? Um, yeah, I mean, um, uh, sorry, my internet just uh, clicked out uh, uh, again there, but um, yeah, I mean, certainly um, a, a lot of people um, locally, um, uh, you know, we, it, you know, the, our presence has, you know, we, I, has been much more sort of um, noticed and we've got, you know, more interest in volunteering, um, you know, all sorts of people, you know, we, we run little allotments, uh, on our site for local people to grow their own food. And that was, I think, a real godsend for people who are, you know, so um, so incarcerated otherwise by lockdown. So um, yeah, in, in all sorts of ways, I think, um, you know, a silver lining of it has been that people have engaged more with, um, you know, the, the, the natural environment around them and the, you know, the, 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 the local food and production and farming that's going on. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I love about your book, Chris, is you sort of open it with this lovely anecdote called The Civet's Tale and this, this quote from the economist uh, Thomas Sowell that there are no solutions, there are only trade-offs. And, and it, it sounds to me like, in a, you know, we're always making trade-offs and we're not always aware of what those trade-offs are. Um, you know, we're trading off our time together for, you know, for employment or we're constantly making these trade-offs. And, and one of the things that I really appreciate about your book is, you know, as you've been kind of, as you sort of lay out your vision and your argument for a small farm future, you say that the trade-offs will still be there. I mean, that, that there is no solution and you're very clear that what you're proposing is not a, a panacea or some kind of utopian blueprint, but that, you know, we really have to look at what those trade-offs are and, and, and have some, make some clear decisions about where, what we value and, and what we're willing to forego and what we're not willing to forego. Yeah, for sure. I mean, farming is intrinsically a matter of trade-offs, you know, with any type of farming, whether we're talking about sort of large scale industrialized farming or the kind of farming that Jyoti and I do, you know, we're trying to push the envelope of productivity um, in various ways. And that, um, you know, there's, that, that there's no kind of um, magic bullet solution that inevitably involves um, you know, trade-offs that, you know, typically it means um, more, more work, more energy input and sort of ecological blowback of various kinds. Um, and so what I'm arguing really is that, you know, the best way of, of mitigating um, those, that, that blowback is by, um, is, is by more labor intensive, less fossil fuel energy intensive farming and by, you know, by, by relocalizing it, it makes you more aware of what those ecological feedbacks are. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, when I was chatting with you the other day, Brianne, we were sort of talking about the metaphor of the juggler, you know, it, it kind mm -hmm. of feels like uh, in modern life, we're sort of juggling more and more balls, trying to keep more and more balls in the air. Um, and, you know, and that's, it's, it's kind of getting harder and harder and we're starting to, to, to drop them, you know, <laughs> and that's kind of quite a, a scary scenario. Um, but it does, you know, it does give us this opportunity to sort of step back and, you know, literally and figuratively, you know, take some of the energy um, out of the out of the situation to rethink what we're doing. And, you know, the way I think we have to do that uh, is by a uh, lower energy input, uh, more labor intensive and more localized farming that's more keyed into its ecological base and more keyed into local economies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, let's, uh, if we can, let's talk about one of those trade-offs that you mentioned um, at the beginning, which is labor. Um, because one of the things in your book that you sort of, uh, I think, stress is the need to re-embrace human labor. Um, you know, and that we all have to get kind of comfortable with the amount of time and labor that small-scale farming requires. Uh, but of course, historically, and, and even today, you know, the rigors of labor haven't been equally distributed. So, so how do we confront that? And how do we let that inform us and move forward in equitable ways? 
um, perhaps having been informed by, you know, some of the, the inequities of the past. And, and Jyoti, I'd be really interested in your perspective on this as well, because I know you've done a lot of international work. Um, and so I think, you know, it would be very interesting to kind of hear how, how, in your views, how that can kind of play out in a, in a future scenario, as opposed to in a past, you know, some of, some of what the past scenarios have been. Who's going first? Do you want to speak to that, <laughs> Jyoti, or shall I? Well, you go ahead. You wrote the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, one reason why I'm really glad Jyoti's here is, you know, I, I think there's been this whole discourse that, um, you know, small scale farming is a thing of the past. You know, we've got to get people out of farming and into the cities. But I mean, the reality is that um, there are still more farmers in the world than any other occupation, basically. Um, not all of them are having um, a, a great deal of fun. But the reason for that is precisely the equity point that you made, Brianne, that, uh, you know, a, a lot a lot of the um, the ease and wealth um, that we enjoy. Uh, I mean, you know, we can debate how easy and, uh, you know, how much we are enjoying it in, in the global north. But a lot of that comes at the expense of, of farm households and other households in, in the global south. And, you know, we're also offloading the consequences of that onto the future. So part of the book is a you know, is a global equity argument about the need for us to uh, re-embrace the work that we need to do, um, in, you know, in, in, in terms of creating livelihoods for ourselves. Um, and, you know, the, the reality is that uh, people don't always um, uh, get out of farming and earn more money and, and have a better time of it. You know, there's an awful lot of historically and today an awful lot of people are forced out of farming um, due to sort of inequities in in the global economy that pushes them into precarity and underemployment and and urban misery of all, of all kinds so you know the, the the idea that you know nobody wants to farm anymore is is you know is not really true but nevertheless going back to the trade-offs point um, you know that there, there are no simple solutions you know I talk quite a lot about um, gender for example in part three of the book you know i think there are sort of big issues historically about the, uh, the, the the sort of patriarchal nature of household farming and so um you know there are no simple solutions to that but it's about um sort of you know juggling um uh with the uh, you, you know the structure of the household within the community and within um wider political circuits which is something if peter's around maybe uh we can uh, we can get into that in terms of participatory democracy um, and, and some of these ideas, which also La Via Campesina that uh, Jyoti much more than, than than I has been involved in, you know, places a big emphasis on on that as well. And, you know, the fact that most household farmers globally are women. Um, so, um, you know, again, as all sorts of really key trade offs that we that we're not getting right right now, but, you know, but we need to work on. Yeah, I think when it comes to labor, you need to look at the dignity that's involved in the labor and mm -hmm. the variety of tasks that are there and how enjoyable they are, whether it's, you know, monotonous um, and, you know, you keep having to do the same thing over and over or whether it's something that's like varied and interesting. And, you know, if you've got small scale farms, the, the work tends to be varied and interesting. And if people have some control over what they're being asked to do because it's they're a decision and you know they have some sort of autonomy and they're gaining something back from that it tends to be something that people want to do as long as that can be fairly remunerated um you know and and that the environment that you're working in is good so all around the world that you know that you know almost half the world's population are small-scale peasant farmers uh and there's statistics from the um etc group saying you know they provide almost 70 percent of global food security but it's also one of the most marginalized occupations. It's one where, you know, they're often politically targeted. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of those farms are in places where the environment is degrading, you know, and, and, and not as a result of their farming methods, but because of circumstances out of their control. There's also a lot of marginalization of the idea of being a small scale farmer you know the peasant is considered a dirty word in, in a lot of countries and you know it's considered something that people don't want to be anymore 
But if the dignity is involved in there, if there's respect and dignity in how people are farming and working, then working hard is, can actually be an amazing thing. And we have to reclaim and think about what work is. You know, when you're physically doing things with your body and you're creating something that can be sold and valued or consumed by your family and valued, then it is something that we can actually embrace rather than trying to get away from having labor involved. It can provide really varied and interesting employment. So it just kind yeah. of depends on the conditions that are there. Yeah, I mean, I talk about that quite a lot in different parts of, of the book, basically um, autonomous labor, you know, at the individual, at the household and at the community level. And, you know, that's a, that, that's the sort of key thing historically where, you know, people are critical of the notion of the small scale farming, essentially, because people were incorporated non autonomously into these huge hierarchical systems. And that's part of what the kind of small scale, um, you know, the small farm argument is about, is about, you know, the, the, the people's ability to um, create an, an autonomous livelihood, um, exactly in the way that Jyoti was talking about. And that has all sorts of knock on implications for, um, you know, the way that we construe our societies, which I talk about, particularly in parts three and four of the book. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean, and of course you make, the, you, sort, you stress the point that, you know, we're talking about um, a small farm future, not a, you know, as opposed to, um, you know, big agribusiness. And, and so there, it sounds like what you're saying is that it's possible that within that small farm kind of, dynamic they're done the right way there's many opportunities actually for diversity of labor and for for sort of ferreting out the the work that would be meaningful to individuals who are who are engaging in that way as opposed to these very large scale kind of monolithic um you know it doesn't have to be farms but but anything that is you know there's a level of dehumanization that goes along with that in so many cases yeah, and also energy. I mean, you know, one aspect of the, 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 the reason that we need small scale farming, I think, is because at a kind of domestic or, or uh, yeah, small commercial scale, there's all sorts of synergies between, um, you know, the household and the, the farm, you know, the, 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 the waste products of one become an input into another. There's a, there's a kind of ecological efficiency to the small farm that you don't really get uh, with large scale commodity farming where essentially we're using cheap energy uh, which is um, polluting, which is uh, contributing to climate change to kind of um, buy our way out of the, the ecological feedback. So, you know, certainly there's that, that kind of synergistic argument is key to, to the need for a small farm future. Also the, um, the kind of ecological feedbacks that it's very easy for us to offload the consequences of our actions in agriculture and in industry and other aspects of life, um, you know, either onto people who are less empowered in other parts of the world or onto the future. Whereas, uh, you know, if you're farming locally and are uh, and autonomously, um, it, you know, it's much easier to see the consequences of your, of your actions and adjust your farming accordingly. And again, you know, that point about labor, we were just talking about, you know, autonomous labor is key, you know, rather than, um, uh, you know, having people organized uh, coercively into, um, you know, in, 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 into sort of large scale um, farm labor. You know, I mean, I, I talk in the book about the, the, the sort of complex histories by which people have been both yoked unwillingly to the land and, and divested unwillingly from the land, you know, and we, we need to sort of talk about that in a more nuanced way, I think, than just sort of uh, assuming that they're, you know, that people don't want to farm or that there are certain correct ways of farming, you know, that, that that's the debate that we need to be having, uh, you know, much more intensively than we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a bunch in there that I want to unpack and, and return to that, that you both have said, I mean, one thing just, uh, and this kind of goes back to something Jyoti was talking about at the beginning, just in terms of having your kids around more during this time um, and sort of the nature of our lives and our livelihoods. One thing that I have been sort of amazed and delighted to see over the last couple of months is the number of parents uh, that have told me that they wish they could just send their children to, to small organic farms instead of back to school. 
And, and I found that very fascinating because it, it shows in a sense that, that small farms are offering a model for something that's very attractive as a way to organize other aspects of society. And, and, and it's interesting to think of small farms in that way as, you know, okay, maybe we don't have all the answers right now, but just going back to the idea of where do you orient yourselves and, and, and kind of how do we look? And it's a very interesting moment at, at this point to kind of be looking at small farms and what's going on there and, and sort of all these opportunities that are sort of suggesting themselves to other aspects of, of society and, and of community life. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's, a, it's a really interesting point. I mean, I guess, you know, I, I uh, sort of had a fairly traditional academic education and sort of an, um, not so much of a practical background. And I've sort of got into all these things in terms of getting excited about um, thinking about ecological feedback and loops, you know, for, for example, uh, my wife Cordelia is our local expert on composting toilets. And, you know, when I first heard about the idea of uh, composting human manure rather than just flushing it away i thought you know what a, what a crazy idea that is but when you start thinking about the uh you know the the energetic cycles and the nutrient cycles involved um you know why wouldn't you have a compost toilet but then of course it's difficult to have one in a city so you know we get into a whole debate about uh you know nitrogen phosphate cycling you know where are we getting the nutrient inputs into our farming uh, uh, and so on and so on but on the other hand, you know, on our site, we have a small educational projects, um, shared earth learning, and they take in kids um, who are really struggling at school, you know, who, who, who aren't really into the academic route um, and are sort of on the point of being excluded from school. And they come onto our site and just start engaging with the natural world around them and, you know, seeing, you know, even just seeing sort of insects and bees buzzing around, um, you know, seeing plants growing, seeing animals and, and suddenly they're engaged in a way that they're never going to be in a classroom, um, which, you know, goes back to, to, to your intro, Brienne. So, you know, I think at all sorts of different levels, um, you know, farming is just the key point where human society interacts with the natural world that ultimately encompasses us as human beings. And, you know, we've, we've sort of, you know, we've got to engage with that in a, in a, you know, in a much more fundamental way than, um, than, than our education generally has, has led us to. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Um, yeah, I mean, there's this, you know, you, you talk a lot in the book about small scale farming and small economies as an adaptive response. And it, it just, you know, makes me think and reminds me that part of that adaptive response means, you know, not just survival, but, but a healthier, more fulfilling, more joyful way to live, um, a kind of conviviality of community and the opportunity for meaningful work that that seems so clearly missing in so many people's lives and in so many communities at this point and and to me that's one of the most attractive aspects of of what you're arguing for and and what you're proposing here with this book chris is it's not just that we might survive all these terrible crises but at the, it might really offer a happier more fulfilling way for more people to live and that that's a very yeah seductive <laughs> you know argument in favor of a small farm future yeah i mean that's right i mean i think the stakes are high you know the stakes are really high at the moment as you know my my metaphor of the the juggler you know as we start dropping these balls or or knives or or flaming torches or whatever they are, you know there's a lot of potential for this to go wrong you know there's there's you know the, the stakes are high but that is the prize that, 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 that is there for the taking, you know, if we play, you know, I'm sorry, I'm mixing my metaphors here. If we, if we play our, our hand of cards with skill, juggle our, juggle our knives with skill, um, you know, that is what we can, you know, what, what, what we can pull out of this for sure. Um, yeah. So yeah, that, that, that's absolutely right. Yeah. Um, I mean, just going back to another point, if we can, um, you were talking about sort of, both being yoked to the land and divested from the land. And, and it seems to me, I mean, I know you agree with this um, because you wrote a lot about this. Um, and I'm sure that Jyoti has done a lot of work around this. We, we can't 
really talk about society organized around small farms without talking about access to land and what a struggle that is for so many people um, that that the barrier to entry there i mean even putting aside for a moment i guess degradation of land and um you know just the, the the sheer amount of barriers that there are for so many people in terms of accessing land and land tenure um you know as you both know starting a farm from scratch is not easy and so where you know what are the models we can look at that that offer us some direction in terms of easing those barriers so that more people can more people can make this their livelihood well maybe if i quickly try and answer that and then i'd be keen to hand over to jyoti and hear um her perspective i mean i know jyoti for many years has been involved in all sorts of great initiatives that have tried to make um farming more accessible for new entrants you know latterly in her work with the land workers alliance uh I mean, I'm involved in an organization called the Ecological Land Co-op that likewise uh, tries to make uh, affordable small holdings available to people. So, you know, there's all sorts of people and organizations doing great stuff. But ultimately, um, we are up against a big problem, which is that there is a, an awful lot of liquid capital um, flowing about in the world. And that tends to find its way back into land values which inflate beyond the price by which most ordinary people can afford to buy land and and beyond the price which most farmers can actually recoup the the the, the costs of land through producing ordinary food commodities and so ultimately i think you know there's gonna there's gonna be a tough politics around land ownership as as we confront um the, the the crises that we're facing and you know I, I don't think there's you know you know we know historically that those politics are often pretty brutal and you know I don't think there's a way we can sugarcoat that you know if we look back at the history of the UK or the US or, or most parts of the world you know what I do try and argue in the book is that the fact that um, you know we're dropping all our juggling balls and uh, so much that we've taken for granted is up in the air it does provide an opportunity, I think, for us to try and figure these things out um, afresh as communities, you know, that we have to start looking to, you know, how we can uh, provide for our material needs locally, as, as we've been talking throughout this. And, you know, I, I, what I try and discuss in, in the book is a, a Republican politics, not, not Republican as in, um, you know, the one of the major parties over in the US, but, um, you know, a longer tradition of, of, of um, communities um, sort of figuring out how they can get along together. So, you know, I think land politics are going to be tough, um, but there are ways in which um, the, the present moment in global politics might just create some openings for us to try and figure out those politics better as communities um, than perhaps we've done in the past. But I'm keen to hear, I mean, Jyoti is involved in so much um, practical stuff on this. I'd, I'd be keen to hear her thoughts. Well, I can bring in the planning angle, Chris, and so is it both. <laughs> oh, let's not <laughs> talk about Cordelia planning, just planning us. I, remember, I remember your planning appeal very well. <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah. Jo <laughs> Jyoti was uh, instrumental in us being able to um, you know, build a house on our land. So yeah, both of us have uh, spent years uh, um, battling the planners. Yeah, but, battling the planners. <laughs> Well, the issue there is that basically because land is quite expensive and there's all these things that make it very difficult to you know, make the price of land proportionate to the agricultural enterprise you wouldn't want to run if you're a small scale farmer. Um, most new entrants that aren't um, you know, well endowed financially have to buy land that doesn't have a dwelling on it. And also buying land without a dwelling on it somehow feeds into the autonomy that people seek when they're trying to set up their own small holdings. Small holdings aren't just about financial viability. They're, they're, you know, and, and it's not purely a commercial sort of enterprise where you're just selling your product and, and you pay for all the inputs that you need for your life. They're very much about trying to combine self-sufficiency and subsistence living with commercial output as well, which is pretty much what peasant farming around the world does. So 
you know, you're providing your own housing, you often provide your own electricity, um, a lot of your own entertainment <laughs> as well. Um, you know, we, we, here on, on my farm, we, you know, 90% of our food that we eat comes from our, our small holding, you know, so we haven't got all that outgoing all the time for, for the food, you know, and that's what happens when people trying to move on to land is that the government regulations say you need to prove that your farm is financially viable. And they often look at what, you know, what those financial viability figures would be considering you're a traditional kind of farm enterprise with normal outgoings of life. And what we do when we go to appeals is actually challenge that concept and show what the, you know, financial worth is of all the things that you provide for yourself on your land if you're running a small holding um, and, and how that enriches your life and how people can actually live on quite low incomes, but have incredibly good quality of life. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's an interesting thing when we think about that globally, you know, what, what is our value system for valuing, um, for, for valuing life and what's, you know, what is a good life? Is it all about money or is it about a bit more than that? And, you know, it provides a good solution to food poverty. If people have access to land, they can provide a lot of their own food to help supplement diets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's let's talk a little bit more if we can, kind of about the role of of governance um, and government. I I, um, I I mean I don't want to give away what I what I've heard Chris say, which is you know very little. Um, <laughs> there's very, very little role, <laughs> um, but I, but but you know certainly there's no way around things like policy and legislation at some level, and so you know, do we have to be turning, and this may be a wonderful moment for Peter to join in if he wants to and is able to, but but let's talk a little bit about the intersection between, you know, local democracy and small, and kind of nurturing um, local small farms. What what needs to happen? And is there, you know, can can one exist without the other, I guess, in a sense? Um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I'd be interested to, I mean, yeah, be interested to hear Peter if he's, uh, around and I know Jyoti has, um, been, uh, ah, he is. I <laughs> <laughs> um, sh shall I, I, yeah, I, I mean, part, part of my argument in the book is, I mean, clearly where we're at, at the moment, we need people working on all sorts of different levels. So I know, you know, Jyoti has been working incredibly hard. Uh, we you know we've got a big agriculture bill going through parliament at the moment in the context of Brexit and Jyoti has been working incredibly hard on that. Peter has been working incredibly hard on trying to build participatory local democracy um, from, from the ground up locally. I mean, in my book, I, I guess I talk, uh, you know, again, going back to my juggling metaphor, I promise I'll, I'll retire this metaphor for, for good after tonight. But, you know, I think governments increasingly have got more and more on their plates and, 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 and are less and less able to deliver the kind of goods and services and welfare that people need locally. And so, you know, this is the opportunity, you know, I, 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 I talk about it in the book in the context of what I call the supersedure state, and I, I won't go on about that now, but I think, um, you know, we, I think we're gonna see uh, centralized states withdrawing more into their core areas, and there's gonna be the need, you know, people are gonna be forced to create politics uh, more um, around the peripheries of that locally. Um, and that, you know, is, is very much been what Peter has been doing um, practically. Um, so I'd be, yeah, perhaps this would be a moment to hand over to him if he's willing to say a bit more about flat pack democracy. I'm, I'm happy to say a, a word or two. I'm sorry. I mean, I've been, I've been here um, listening and, and thank you. I wasn't quite sure how I'd be. I made the bad mistake of questioning the science of gravity. Um, <laughs> uh, I, as I understood it, all science is up for questioning at the moment, but some of it's clearly more entrenched than other bits. Um, uh, yeah, I love the, the, the chapter that Chris referred to there about the supersedia state was, I mean, I've, I've really read all the books, look at all those blue <laughs> things. Oh, really that's so nice before. to see. Yeah, <laughs> back them in now. No, um, and uh, the bit of what you, it's quite well in there of the supersedia state, which is, is, exactly what you're saying Chris the need to link those things together to to have the ideas that are within this book linked into um, power and and decisions being made at a local level is, is, is crucial and what I think is really exciting is that you make that doable and that's what that chapter is all about 
um, is essentially saying, as I read it, and I've been saying in relation to flat back democracy, in a sense that as as the, the centralist state collapses, people won't be looking nearly so much. And you, in your, your epilogue, you, 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 you talk about that. You've got a lovely um, tale, which, what did you call it? You'll remember, and I can't find the page. The um, uh, Goldman Sachs uh, ra yeah. and raising chickens. That's Goldman Sachs care if you raise chickens, exactly. <laughs> um, and I think that, that those two chapters, those two bits are, are crucial within this. I think that there is potential for more and more stuff to be done locally underneath the, uh, uh, the state, if you like. Um, and, and, and so having designed ways whereby people are genuinely engaged, and my work's all been about trying to really build proper participation because representative democracy doesn't work. It never really did, but it definitely doesn't now. We are not represented by the people that, that, that you know, the few of us ever voted for in the first place. So, um, so finding ways where people are really, really involved, which is exactly what so much of what you're talking about is, whether that's the workers all sitting around as they have cups of tea deciding what to do on a small farm, or whether it's people really being properly talked about and talked with in their bits of community, uh, you know, that's, that's the future for me. And so, you know, I think that, that, that's, that element of this book is really exciting. And I wrote in the, uh, you know, just now in the, in the chat, I think that the real challenge for Chelsea Green is going to be getting this book out to, um, you know, it's not a book about farming. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's a book, it's a book that covers the lot. Um, and, and so many of the principles that you're talking about expand beyond um, farming. And, and the moment, you know, is really now. And I think, yeah, it's a, that'd be really interesting. So I don't know what else I can say about, um, you know, the, the need to do that locally. I and mean, I'm, I'm involved in an extension of, of Froome's politics, trying to support people all over the country to, um, to take over their local councils and run them in more democratic ways at the moment. But I think that absolutely links in with a huge number of climate and ecological emergencies that have been declared. In Britain, nearly three quarters of councils have declared these emergencies. But then what? You know, but your book, in a sense, there's loads of stuff in there, which is a sort of a, a, a council picking that up can go, look at all these things we can support. Look at all this planning permission we can, we can help to get into. Look at all these ways we can make it easier, which will tick off all sorts of um, necessities in, in that line as well. Yeah, I mean that. That's right. It's it's uh, um, you know. I think, I mean, wherever you start, you know, wherever you start in 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 um, society, it leads on to to other places. So I mean, so, you know, I think farming is critical because it's absolutely key to um, you know to the sort of material livelihoods. You know, we we we're so engaged with our electronics, we sometimes forget that we're actually um, biological organisms yeah. that that need to that need to eat and breathe. Um, <laughs> But yeah, the farming is is conditioned by um, you know by by these larger forces. Um, but you know what I think is so important about your work, Peter, that goes back to what we were discussing earlier about um, you know sort of gender issues, for example, is that political participation is so key, and it's you know it's not just a, a, a sort of tick box exercise. You know, to actually hear people's voices, to actually come together. As communities, I mean, obviously, the Black Lives Matter movement is is, is another um, huge thing at the moment that's really driving that home. Is um, uh, you know, it's 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 really difficult and 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 problematic and tough to um, to participate and for voices to be heard. But you know, that's what we've got to be doing if we're gonna, you know, that great vision that Brianne was sketching. That I think you know we can deliver through more uh, localized economies and through smaller scale farming. But, you know, we really do need to be discussing these, these really tough issues in a much more, um, much more thoughtful uh, participatory way than is the case in, in, in present politics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, it's wonderful just to, to sit and listen to you all kind of riff about all this. Um, I'm looking at the time and I want to be mindful of that and I'm wondering if it might make sense. I mean, certainly I, I don't know if um, the three of you have any thoughts you want to share before we jump into um, some questions or we can just jump right in. I am. Um, interest. Of no, no, I was just going to say I was looking at some of these earlier and to be honest, 
you could just answer the lot by saying, read my book. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm being slightly facetious, but obviously a lot of them, the, the, the amount of detail that has gone into some of these, there are some which particularly relate to um, COVID and some which that's not quite true. But, um, and, and some of the questions say that it's probably covered in the book and they're right. Um, you know, there is some, uh, 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 quite a lot of these are covered in the book. Um, but there's particularly some which are updated in that sense that are uh, of, of the moment. Well, I'm glad you said that, Peter, so that I didn't have to say that. But uh, yeah, there is there is a lot of detail in in, in the book. Uh, less than you know, Brianne uh, made me take out some of the uh, the more turgid uh, details. So I mean, hopefully it's it's uh, sufficiently detailed, but not too detailed to to, to to put you off. Um, so I think. Uh, yeah, I think we came up with a good product between us. <laughs> it's, it's... Yeah, apparently, apparently, Brian took out the rant, or at least that's what Chris said, but I, I don't think that's true at all. I really, really enjoyed the rant. No, as I said, I made him move the rant forward. <laughs> I wanted him to open the book with a rant. Um, here's, a, here's a question um, for you all. Um, many people have recently found that they can do their white collar work from home. Do you think there's a place for groups of people doing both remote white collar work and small scale farming? And if so, you know, does that balance need to be seasonal or how, how would you envision that? Um, just, I, Jyoti, do you want to? I think it's a great idea. That's essentially what I'm doing now. <laughs> <laughs> in many ways, and 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 to be honest, it, you know, it's you know, pe people need life work balance. If we become a society where people are so disconnected from nature that people are on computers all the time, I think we're we're going to experience a lot more mental health issues. We're going to experience, you know, a lot more problems, um, and and physical problems as well from people just sat on a computer all day. Mm -hmm. and, and and you know, I think it's a really great balance to have, you know. A, a combination of being able to do things that are connected to other places and you know use your mind in lots of different ways but also be able to go out and do outdoor work so i, I don't necessarily see that, that that's a problem you know we're you know nowadays like the, the trajectory for people's work is that people are juggling four or five different jobs you know rather than having one job actually that's more common than people having a singular job with one contract mm -hmm. um and and i think that's actually quite a healthy trend and something we could build on because it means people have time to spend with their kids on the land before and after school or when they're not doing their work or you know and and you know even even now when i'm working pretty much full time you know nine to five uh, during the week we still are able to be producing almost 90 percent of our own food on the farm as well as selling things. So actually, if you juggle your schedule right and you're working with other people, it's entirely possible on the small mm -hmm. farm to do both. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, part of what it, I, I think is is being called for is a kind of reconceptualization of of what work is. I mean, in the same way, you know, I think what's needed is a reconceptualization of, of what education is, what so many things are. Um, and I, I think you're right, Jyoti, that, that kind of having that diversity of the way you're using your brain and your body. I mean, people clearly um, often thrive in circumstances like that. So there is a, there's an interesting and important opportunity at this moment in time, I think, for people to really, for us all to begin to kind of reconceptualize what, what work looks like or, or, or what education looks like or what, you know, or what a day looks like. And, and I mean, just to add to that, I think also, you know, what, what farming is, because um, it's, um, you know, what, one of the points I make in the book is the need to decommodify farming, um, uh, you know, so that people are producing for themselves, but also for us um, to embrace the fact, you know, that, that, that we're all that we're all farmers, you know, like the, 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 the sort of notion that there's, uh, you know, something I've struggled with, with, you know, particularly actually around this book being presented as a farmer. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm not a proper farmer. You know, I haven't got a, a sort of 350 horsepower four wheel drive tractor. Um, and, and, you know, I think we've sort of got out of that, 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 that sense of, um, you know, just producing, you know, being a gardener, um, you know, producing stuff for yourself, um, you know, your farming, you know, we, we're, we you know, we're all part of this food producing culture. Um, and that, you know, it's so important, you know, whether we are, producing commercially on a larger scale or you know whether we're volunteering at a community garden you know we need to embrace that continuum I think rather than sort of offloading externalizing the need to produce food to you know other to a, to, to a small proportion of the population or 
often enough, you know, like in most of the wealthy countries, anything that's labor intensive, we tend to um, externalize it to other countries where labor is cheaper and, you know, that that's not sustainable long term. Hmm. Chris, I think that point, that point you just made about uh, uh, including for, um, um, allotment holders and gardeners and so on within the picture, which you do in the book, is really important. There was about to be or there is a, um, a, 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 a people looking at um, where food has been grown in Froome at the moment that the town council is doing. And I, um, and I really encouraged them to make sure they included that bit as well. So it's not just local farms like yours, because certainly over the last, you know, during this year, the amount of food that's been grown in people's gardens, including their front gardens, which used to be lawns, you know, and so on, is, is really important, I think, in terms of the well-being and so on. But also that uh, it's a really significant element now, isn't it? And brings people in in a way that uh, there wasn't before as well as all sorts of clever joining up. So you get um, the excess shared in things like uh, community fridge, you get things that are, you know, all sorts of schemes that, uh, that enable people to, to share. So, because so much food in the traditional model is wasted, isn't it? Completely obscenely. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I've got this um, community processing facility on my farm. And at the moment it's apple juicing season. So there's um, 52 different small holdings and we're part of a cooperative. And um, I noticed there was a question about policy, policies that can support small farms. And, and we got a grant from the European Union to help um, create our processing facility. It's in a big timber frame barn that we all built together, like a barn raising. And we've got an apple press that'll press apples and make, you know, a thousand bottles of apple juice in a day or whatever. And different small holdings in the area all come and press their juice. And it's really nice. Like at the moment, you know, I'm, I'm at, on my farm, you know, every day there's different members of the community coming and pressing their apples making their apple juice that they can sell they've got their own orchards with all the amazing varieties of different apples you can get in the west country of england you know in different ways some of the people don't even have their own orchards but they go and scrump all the apples or help the old boys that can't pick up their apples anymore to to do the things and it's a it's about creating a sense of community and that cooperation and that collaboration meant we could have facilities that would actually be quite expensive for one small farm to buy but because we're sharing the resources and government helped us out to be able to create that resource for the local community. We've created something that we can all have a stake in and makes us self-sufficient or a little bit more financially viable, but also spend time together doing, you know, fun jobs together, which is what small scale agrarian farming is a bit about. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't really have enough space in the book to talk about some of those issues. I mean, I think, you know, there are some interesting issues I do talk about, about the, um, the some of the tensions between household or family farming and, and, and sort of larger scale cooperation. But certainly one problem that we've had historically is a lot of that infrastructure in farming, you know, the, the sort of um, local abattoirs, for example, is, a, you know, I know the Sustainable Food Trust here in the UK is campaigning around that because that makes a huge difference for smallholders and, and, you know, some of those that, you know, that sort of collective um, facilities. So it's, it's great, obviously, that you've got your juicing operation set up where it can bring people together. But, you know, we've We've really got to build that up from quite a low base um, from, from from where we are, and, and you know, and, and a lot of the reasons that that has gone is because of cheap fossil energy that you know we know um, we can't continue to rely on. And basically, decades of underinvestment in local food systems. I mean, decades. You know, we've, yeah. uh, the, the whole narrative is that the global food supply and the global, you know, the, the the trade systems and all those things are so important, and it, and it pits local food economies, you know, up against any food being be able to be produced anywhere in the world. And if it happens to be that the Somerset apples aren't the same sort of ones that you can get from France, well, when they put loads of subsidy into like big monocultures of orchards and saying comparative advantages means they can be grown more in France, you know, efficiently, then those facilities that would have been there as a part of the community, as part of our traditional local food culture, they slowly die out. And, yeah. and, and they haven't been invested in for decades where the investment's going completely the opposite direction. I talk quite a lot in the book about comparative advantage, you know, some, some of the old dead economists like David Ricardo in particular, I think, you know, we need to, um, you know, we need to get our heads around his analysis of um, global trade and, um, and land rent as well, which is, you know, going back to the earlier conversation uh, uh, about access to land, um, you know, the, those, those guys who were sort of in the, 
in the thick of the early industrialization of um, um, uh, you know of agrarian economies have got a lot of interesting things to say um, that touch exactly on those points that Jyoti was raising. Mm -hmm. um, there are so many interesting questions uh, that have come in, and uh, this one from John Thackera, uh I think is 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 a compelling one. He asks, how important is the potential of city people to help out on the farm on a part-time basis, as happened in the past? Do we need new platforms or services to enable this to happen? Anyone? <laughs> yeah, today, well, today I was on a DEFRA meeting, <laughs> um, trying to defend the concept of peri-urban farms and how important they are for delivering public goods. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, and some of the other, uh, you know, or farmers organizations on the call were saying, oh, you can't have proper farms outside of cities, you know, isn't this going to suck up all the money that's there for the subsidy system? You know, they don't really deliver, deliver on all these public goods. And um, what I was trying to explain is that, you know, if you've got a, a, a farm that's on the outskirts of a city that's um, able to, you know, be a place that people can get to by public transport from a city, or, or, or walk there or bike there or easily drive there, then it can allow an opportunity for people who are in the middle of a city to be able to access food at an affordable price, but also, you know, get, get you know, able to work on the land and, you know, learn those skills and connect with nature and breathe fresh air and, you know, contribute to biodiversity and all those things. And, and there's amazing farms out there that are, you know, dealing with volunteers all the time. And it's very, really important that we invest in those peri-urban farms or urban farms to make sure that we give that opportunity to, for people who live in cities. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I agree with all of that. I mean, I, there is a chapter in the book called uh, The Country and the City, um, where I sort of go through uh, various different models, uh, you know, a, a, again, at a somewhat general level. Um, and, you know, there are all sorts of ways that um, people in cities can get involved. Uh, I mean, I am sceptical, you know, you, you read a lot nowadays about vertical farming and, and, and cities being able to produce all their own food, which basically I think is quite fanciful. So, I mean, I think longer term in, the, you know, cities are actually huge users of energy um, and resources. So, you know, longer term, you know, we do need to talk about ruralization, de-urbanization. Um, and, you know, that, again, that's one of these issues that I think is potentially going to be politically very difficult, but also is going to create opportunities, um, you know, for us to reimagine a rural agrarian landscape. Um, but for sure, you know, uh, we, you know, to, to I mean, although you know, the the figure is often touted that more people live in cities now than in uh, the countryside. But um, you know, there's still a majority of people living in relatively small cities where there's some potential for interaction with its hinterland. But you know, one of the problems again with the global fossil energy economy is that that you know that relationship between um, you know, town, village, market, town, countryside is broken. You know, you, as Jyoti was saying earlier, you, you know, you go in the store, you, you know, you can buy food from anywhere in the world. So we really do need to rethink that relationship between, um, you know, between different levels of, of urban concentration and surrounding countryside. Um, but for sure, you know, uh, we need, a, 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 you know, we need to bring urban people into that debate. Mm -hmm. And here, um, of course, in Britain, we're um, we're about to leave Europe, and and that w won't that be another um, shock, Chris? That, and and but in a sense, is also an opportunity in that that a bit like Corona, that you know things are going to happen, and therefore there will be opportunity. So so there will be these seventy mile tail blacks of lorries who are no longer able to bring in fruit and veg from Europe. So. So that will bring into question the whole relationship as, as presumably food prices either F, you know, massively increase in cities and or things are not available. Will that not cause people to question and therefore look to other opportunities and therefore hopefully go and buy your book and work out how to do it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's really complicated, you know, because obviously the government discourse is still very much about global trade and, you know, being a, you know, being a, a you know, be, being a rich country that can sort of buy what we need on global markets. 
On the other hand, we've got a whole crisis of nature, biodiversity, and the whole rewilding movement, you know, which is uh, all sorts of debates, again, which I, which I touch on in the book about meat production and, um, you know, how we sort of manage the balance between um, wilderness and farmland, uh, pastures, woodland, cropland, um, and so on. But I mean, ultimately, I, I do some modelling in the book um, where, you know, I, I, I try and look at whether Britain, including if it's swelled, as I think it will be by climate refugees, you know, can we feed ourselves in, you know, in this very densely populated country? And the answer is, I think, yeah, we can. Um, uh, you know, it'll it'll uh, require a lot of um, clever thinking from us. But yeah, we can do it. The problems are not fundamentally ecological or agrarian problems. They're social and political problems. Um, but we do need to be start to think about that. I mean, Tim Lang, uh, a retired professor of food policy at, at City University, has just brought out a, a big bumper book, which I must confess I been too busy writing my own book to, to read his one but you know he's got some real uh, solid analysis of um, national food security and you know again going back to David Ricardo and comparative advantage we need to start thinking about um, you know local and national food production in, in different ways to the way that we have historically and, and you know doing it um, um, uh, in, in collaboration, you know, the point is not a kind of a negative agenda of I'm all right, Jack, we're producing for ourselves, you know, it's about um, sort of local autonomy as a, as a, as, as a sort of collegial way of, of, of working with other people, but we need to rethink this all entirely and, you know, Brexit is, um, you know, is another one of those harbing as a bit like COVID that is suddenly uh, reshuffling the pack. Um, I think it's really interesting to, oh, sorry. That's okay, go ahead. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, yeah, no, I talk to lots of um, people in India because um, I work a lot with the farmers movements there. And what's really interesting is that so many um, young people from villages migrated to the cities um, and lots went into universities doing all sorts of degrees in computer programming or medical or whatever it is. And then realized um, that either the jobs, if they were doing jobs like working as domestic servants or on building sites or selling you know, food to passing traffic or whatever when they migrated to cities was rubbish, or if they went to university and they went and uh, you know, ended up working in call centers, it was a bit degrading as well. And um, when lockdown happened in, in India, you know, all the people that were dependent on precarious labor in the cities started migrating back to the villages, you know, many of them walking hundreds and hundreds of miles. Um, and what's been interesting is hearing the stories of re-ruralizing, you know, from both, both groups, both the migrant labor workers and the, and the young university graduates finding out that there weren't the jobs there that they were expecting to get in that kind of um, economy and, and realizing going back to farming going back to the rural areas and regenerating livelihoods that maybe, you know, we're more, you know, um, where, where farmers are more computer illiterate and they're half doing, you know, white collar jobs and they're half doing farming or they're coming back, you know, you know, young lads, you know, thinking they were going to be Bom Bombay Hollywood stars <laughs> and then realizing that they're going back to like picking mangoes and doing things on farms, but doing it in a different way and a more modern way. It's really interesting hearing hearing about how that's happening and people are realizing that the rural livelihood was a lot better than the dream of the urban livelihood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, Chris, uh, uh, well, everybody, I've got one more for you and then I, I guess we probably better wrap up before we we um, overstay our welcome. But, but, but here's one for you, which is... Um, <laughs> which is uh, how you aim to get politicians to read and listen to the sense of, of what your book presents, Chris. Is, what's your plan for getting this into the hands of the people who, who desperately, desperately need to hear it? Well, that's partly why I invited Jyoti and Peter, because I think they're, um, that, that, that they're um, much more connected than I am to, to, to this sort of thing. So, you know, the fact they've both got a copy of it now, you know, it's job done, I think. Um, no, I think, I think, Chris, we need to get you arguing with Henry Dimbleby a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Just going to put you guys both in a room. <laughs> He's no, doing I mean, a I good strategy. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I really salute both of you for doing sort of hard, hard graft at the political coalface in different ways, because, uh, you know, I've, I've, uh, I've been on, been on the farm and been in my study writing the book. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, I, 
I do th to some extent, I think, um, uh, yeah, you know, we, th I think that the, the politicians are going to have to catch up with the reality on the ground of what, you know, what people are facing and the, the sorts of crises that are upon us and the, the, the juggling balls that they're, that they're inevitably going to have to drop. Um, so, uh, you know, and that, as I've sort of been saying, is the, um, you know, I, I, I think we all realise that, you know, the way that we have um, been living over the last 50 years, the sort of reliance on energy, the, the reliance on the climate being as it is, um, and, and, you know, the, 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 the sort of whole um, logic of economic growth, you know, the economy has globally has grown sort of 6% on average per annum over the last 50 years, we know for sure that's not going to happen over the next 50 years. Um, so sort of we all know that change is coming. Nobody, you know, not, you know, I, I, nobody really has um, the, you know, there isn't, as, you know, part of the whole point of the book is there isn't a magic bullet. You know, there is no kind of singular point in the system where we can intervene and, and sort that out. Um, but, you know, people are, 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 are going to start doing it because they have to locally. And I think, you know, we just have to um, re reconfigure that in our politics, which is what Jyoti and Peter are doing. So I'll hand over to them. <laughs> I'd say, I mean, I'd love to have a, a, a conversation uh, with Brianne and Rosie and others about exactly that question, because I think um, there's so much in this book that, that, that I've said it before, really, that needs to be way bigger than, than just, I, I shouldn't use the word just, but the incredibly valuable and important farming community, you know, it's got to be much wider. And there's a load of answers in here. And I, I think, or, or uh, pointers, I mean, my experience of most politicians is that they're trapped in a system, mm -hmm. which is a disaster. As mm -hmm. individuals, you know, they're fine people trying to do good things. But, but we, we, we've somehow got ourselves into a position which is absolutely uh, disastrous. And so anything that can give them tools to get out of that um, position is useful. So we have to find ways. I mean, as I said, it, this is a really, really readable book, but, I, but how many, how many, you know, uh, certainly MPs are going to uh, uh, read it all, not many, you know, so, so that we'll have to find ways where, where the, the, the main findings are, are made more accessible and also get Chris onto, you know, some, some really big and important uh, platforms. <laughs> I, I'm so glad you made that point, Peter. Actually, because one of the one of the conversations that we we had, I mean, a, a ways back now, as we were beginning to think about how to, you know, you always have these conversations in publishing about how you're going to position a book, and you know, that's part of the title and the subtitle and the cover, and 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 the conversation around that, of course, is always who's the audience for that book, and. And I remember as we were, you know, as Chris was finishing the manuscript and we were starting to have those conversations, I think we all felt like, okay, this is a book that farmers will love, but it's not a farming book per se. It's, it's, it's in a sense, it's a modern classic. It's, a, it's, a, it's that kind of analysis, that kind of social analysis that, that people in various pockets of, of society are going to find so much value in this. Um, not only because of, of what it says about farming and of agrarian life, uh, you know, really it speaks to the, to, you know, we're all facing these crises and, and what Chris presents is uh, the closest thing that I've seen to a roadmap in terms of at least lighting the way forward. I think we need to reclaim that narrative in things. I mean, I was watching the David Attenborough film the other night and it was amazing and I was in tears and everything. And then it turned to the solutions part. And when it talked about farming, it talked about vertical farms and these massive high tech things in Netherlands. And I was so disappointed <laughs> when he'd been talking about diversity and things linked to the land and the indigenous people who had sustainable lifestyles before that. Where is this narrative about a future for small farms where we're actually much more complex, um, you know, where we're actually thinking about developing innovative small farm futures that, you know, ha have so much more diversity embodied in them, more employment, more people <laughs> on the land, you know, yeah. and, and, and a better quality of life for everybody. I, you know, that narrative needs to get into the mainstream thinking as much as the idea that the planet is facing extinction. It needs to be the solution that's at the forefront of our thought. 
Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I spend a lot of my time online and I, I, I do try and work through it in the book. You know, we've got stuck in this terrible duality of progress versus backwardness mm. or, or the sort of notion that small scale or labour intensive farming is somehow turning the clock back or it's nostalgic or it's romantic. And, uh, and then at the same time, there's an enormous amount of romanticism about high tech futures and, and, and sort of decoupling economic growth from from ecological blowback, which we know isn't really happening. So we, you know, we've really got to sort of get beyond that duality. And, 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 yeah, I think as Peter put it very nicely, you know, people individually, people have goodwill and good ideas, but we're trapped in these systems that, you know, may or may not have served us in the past, but they're not going to serve us in the future. We know that for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we do need to sort of break out of those, those systems and we need to break out of these dualities like, progress or high tech versus low tech romanticism uh, and it you know it's a shame um, if programs like that are, uh, are focusing on vertical farming but uh, you know that's I guess you know this is the next battle that we have to fight now you know we're now embracing the problems of climate change the problems of fossil fuel use and you know we need to present some more realistic uh, agricultural scenarios as, as, as ways out of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, I'm looking at the clock and it's 2.41 where I am, which I realize is not what time it is where everybody else, <laughs> where everybody else is. Um, but so, so I guess we'll wrap up there. Um, I want to give one final plug to the book. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> it's always like it was hard to find exactly, <laughs> um, which can be bought anywhere that books are sold, um, you know, through your local bookstore. It is available at the Chelsea Green website um, and on Amazon for those who choose. And we just, Chris, we're, um, we're so pleased and so proud to have this book on our list. This is a very important book. Um, we are just, we're thrilled uh, to bring this out into the world. Um, and and I, I have a massive amount of admiration for what you've accomplished here, having seen it up close. Um, <laughs> So bravo, bravo. It's been a, it's been a privilege. Um, and I will continue to take joy in seeing its success in the world. Uh, and Jyoti and Peter, thank you so much for joining us. Um, the conversation wouldn't have been the same without you. It was lively and, and I'm so grateful for your participation. And, and I look forward to you. seeing where <laughs> things go from here. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Brianne, for, um, you know, turning, uh, uh, turning my splurge of word files into such a beautiful um, final product. And um, yeah, the book is going on sale, I think, generally in, um, in the UK on Thursday. Um, you know, our local bookshop here in Froome Hunting Raven have been incredibly supportive of it. So, you know, just as um, just as small local food providers are key, I think, to the future. So uh, small local booksellers that are, you know, so key to local communities and, and people informing themselves. So um, I hope, uh, hope people listening will buy a copy of the book and I hope they'll buy it from, uh, uh, you know, their local bookseller.